Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Michael Sikora, founding director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House. In part one of this special series, we'll explore what the Socrates Project was, what lessons we can glean from the Reagan era, and how the Chinese regime was able to achieve a fast rise on the global stage. Let's dive in. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Oh, pleasure to be here. So big in the headlines coming up is the 20th National Congress in China, where Xi Jinping is seeking his unprecedented third term. So if he gets that, what does that mean for Americans, especially since Xi Jinping has this vision of the decline of America? Well, if, if you look at it in this time and uh, position so far, he's really pushed the issue of China reclaiming its rightful position as the sole world superpower. And that's been pretty much accepted by the country. Uh, so in some ways, if he still com uh, remains in power, it's really going to push it further. If he doesn't, I don't see it's a major decline for uh, that initiative to, uh, as a national objective. And given that, how do you see that playing out, especially with China's current economic state? Well, one of the differences between China and the United States, and Americans in general, and I'm an American, so I'll poke at them a little bit, is that what their objective is, their national objective, is something which they believe in as a long-term objective. So even if there's a minor downturn in the economy, uh, they'll continue pushing the objective of becoming a dominant, the dominant superpower. In the United States, as we change administrations, slogans change, uh, things like that come and go. It's not going to change in terms of China. So as we continue to decline, China may hit a couple bumps, but I don't see them pulling away from their main national objective, which is very detrimental to the United States. And given China's rise, how was China able to kind of get there so fast? How did America maybe help? Good question. I mean, if you look at it, China has risen to a superpower faster than any country in the history of mankind. And it wasn't that U.S. conscientiously assisted, but as we determined in the Socrates Project, the United States shifted from technology-based planning to finance-based planning. And that shift is what opened the door for China to just accelerate tremendously. And what the difference is, in finance-based planning, the whole foundation of decision-making is optimizing the funds, okay, maximizing profit, whatever. In technology-based planning, the foundation is exploiting the technology more effectively than the competition in order to generate a true competitive advantage, which then dictates the funds, the manpower, the natural resources, and what have you. So when the U.S. is doing finance-based planning, which is an anomaly, because we, the United States, was built on technology-based planning, it basically left us totally open and vulnerable to their technology-based planning. And then you take into consideration that China realized that, China took advantage of that in order to lull America into a false sense of security. And basically, China had an open door in terms of technology exploitation in the United States and around the world. And Michael, you mentioned the Socrates Project. So tell us about that. What is that? I found Socrates, the Socrates Project, in 1983. In 1983, I was playing the game of cat and mouse with the Soviet Union, preventing the flow of technology from the West over to the Warsaw Pact countries. We saw something very interesting at that point in time. We saw that the U.S. and some Western countries were playing the game of competition radically different than what the Soviets did and a couple of the other players. What we saw was whereby in the United States, all we did was maximize profit. And when it came to technology, we just left it to the eggheads to, in R&D to come up with the next breakthrough, OK? Russia was playing a very adroit, adroit game of technology exploitation, both offensive and defensive, both with the good guys and the bad guys, both military and commercial. And we also saw countries like Japan doing the same thing. So while we're just optimizing the money, which actually decreases your competitive advantage, 
But if you measure it from a financial perspective, it looks like you're increasing your competitive advantage. And I'll give you an example in a minute. They were sitting there adroitly maneuvering in the technology. So we saw the Soviets were doing it. We saw that we were in a decline. This was 83. So this was amazing because back then everybody's, oh, it's just a minor perturbation. We'll go right back on top. Uh, they said the problem with Japan was Japan Inc. We need to play, level the playing field, things like that. So we saw that China, or China, they were at that point in time, but Russia mainly was doing technology-based planning. So what we did in Socrates is we saw, because Socrates basically had a two-fold mission. Number one, use all source intel and other data to determine the true underlying cause of US economic and military decline. So we saw it was finance-based planning. Then we saw adversaries were technology-based planning. The second part of our mission was to determine how to reverse US economic and military decline. And again, this was the early 80s when most people didn't even know it existed. So what we said and what we saw was the only way to do it was to shift the United States back to technology-based planning. Okay? But we know we did it before World War II, which is when we shifted, because we talked to some of the old-timers at IBM and GE and places like that. They said, oh, yeah, kid, that's what we did back in the old days. So, but when we looked at Russia, we looked at Japan, how they were doing their technology-based planning, and we saw that they had become significantly more refined. They had advanced the whole process significantly. So we knew if we were going to totally rebuild U.S. economic health and military might that would ensure superpower status for generations, we needed to go far beyond what the Soviets were doing. So what we did is we looked at technology-based planning since the beginning of mankind. We noticed something very, very interesting. Every so many decades, technology-based planning evolves forward, takes an evolution leap forward. Okay. How man utilizes technology to generate a competitive advantage. That was the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and the next evolutionary leap of technology-based planning was the automated innovation revolution. That's where you take the process of exploiting technology for a competitive advantage, develop, acquire, and utilize it, and transform it from a trial and error art into a concrete science. So what we did in Socrates, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, what we did in Socrates is figure out how to generate that next evolutionary leap of technology-based planning, how we exploit technology for a competitive advantage, automated innovation revolution. We built what we call the first generation automated innovation system, which we had to validate. At this point, we're getting strong support out of President Reagan. We had to validate, and we did it on Star Wars, a stealth, counter stealth, and a bunch of other really, really leading edge issues, okay? As a result, President Reagan had an executive order drafted for the system to be built and deployed as a national asset. Okay, now here's one of the cool parts. So the executive order was being drafted, deployed across, going to be deployed across the entire United States. That is one of the things that Reagan used in his negotiations with Gorbachev to convince him to bring down the Soviet Union because the Soviets had already seen what we did in Star Wars. They saw what we did in some other areas. And then they're looking at that being deployed across the entire country, economically and militarily. That meant we could fully decimate the Soviet economy at will. That was one of the bargaining chips used with Gorbachev. It was a quiet bargaining chip. Now, interesting enough, 2010, so we brought down the Soviet Union. 2010, who comes knocking on our door? Putin's people. They wanted us, they knew they had been tracking us very tightly, that we were developing the next generation of the system. They were tracking us very tightly and they said, we would like you to deploy Socrates in Russia to rebuild our economy. Now, make a long story short, we were very careful about the military aspect of it, but we never came to terms and the negotiations broke down. But we saw from their side that Socrates was a key element in those negoti negotiations back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. So that was the Socrates project. Okay. Let, me, let me go back very quickly to this issue of transforming from an art into a science. If you look at technology breakthroughs, and it can be a big breakthrough, a minor breakthrough, any breakthrough in technology, it is nothing more than technology A bumping into technology B to produce technology C. That's all it is. There's no magic there. Anybody that says it is doesn't really understand how it works. 
But how they do it now is they hold cocktail parties. They go to conferences. And they hope Professor A with Technology A bumps into Professor B at that conference. And they sit down and have a beer or drink some coffee and go, hey, I got Technology A. You got Technology B. You know, if we work together, we could produce Technology C. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay. So what does National Science Foundation, what do the universities do to increase this innovation rate? They double the, double the funding for cocktail parties, literally, okay, because it's serendipity. Right now, technology exploitation is based primarily on serendipity. Now, some of you people say, well, we've got the internet, so we can see bigger places. Well, it's still a random approach. What we did in Socrates is went right down to the laws of physics to figure out how we could turn this trial and error, serendipity, low efficiency, high uncertainty process into a concrete science where you knew exact and precise and accurate terms what A was, what B was, where it was, what would be the impact if they combined, what would be the competitive advantage it would generate, how long that competitive advantage would generate, and the nature of that competitive advantage in terms of uh, magnitude, duration, and what have you. That is what gave us the will, gave us the ability to outmaneuver Soviet Union and has the ability to outmaneuver China. Because if you look at China, for every one research the United States has, how many does China have? Depending on whose numbers you believe, it's either 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. How can one outperform, out R&D, 50 or 100? You can't. But what you can do is outmaneuver them. So what we built in the Socrates program was the ability to exploit technology with unprecedented speed, efficiency, and agility. And that includes acquisition, development, and utilization. So, sort of long-winded, but that was, is the Socrates Project. And we're pushing right now to get it reestablished uh, in the country. And Michael, so when you mention technology-based, what are you defining as technology? Technology is any application of science to accomplish a function. And that's one of the very, very key points. Because a lot of people, when they say technology, they're like, oh, it's computers. Oh, it's leading edge. No, it's any application of science to accomplish a function. That's one of the ways that China has been so effective in their technology exploitation, their technology-based planning, is because Americans would look at it and say, ah, oh, the only thing that we need to, need to protect or address or R&D are these real leading-edge quantum technology or AI or whatever. China's technology strategies, national technology strategy, is adroitly maneuvering all the technologies, high-tech, low-tech, medium-tech, okay, it's the hard sciences, it's the soft science. So it's a very adroit. It's, it's comparable to somebody saying, well, you win a military battle by finding the best shot, putting him out there, and let him win the battle. Anybody that knows military would say that's totally ludicrous. Because in a military strategy, which technology strategies are based upon, in a military strategy, you're using tanks the way tanks need to be used, heavy tanks versus light tanks. You've got snipers, you've got all the various players each doing what they do best, and then coordinating them in a fashion which allows them to work in a very coherent, systematic fashion. Okay? Same thing with a technology strategy. You've got high tech, you've got low tech. Each one has a role to play in generating a competitive advantage and in the economic health of a country. So the idea that you know, the only battle is in quantum, AI, and things like that is totally ludicrous. That is a very small percentage of what makes a country competitive. It's that full range of technology. That was Michael Sikora, founding director of the Socrates Project within the Reagan White House. And for those watching our full episode after a break, we hear more from him on how the Socrates Project was used during the Cold War and how that can be leveraged against communist China. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Appbok TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you soon.